Hey church, today we are in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Um, in chapter 11, David falls into sin with Bathsheba. He has her husband uh, Uriah murdered. And this comes up about a year after um, Bathsheba has given birth and they have a newborn baby. And now we're going to see how the Lord deals with David because of his, his grievous sin. Verse 1, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom. and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took, him, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Verse 5, Then David's anger burned greatly against this man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan then said to David, You are the man. And this is a, a powerful correction that God is going to bring into David's life. He uses Nathan the prophet to bring this word to him. Uh, interestingly, Nathan is taking his life in his own hands by going to David. David's already killed one faithful servant to cover up his sin with Bathsheba. There's nothing that says he won't kill the next servant. But Nathan goes with this word of God, and he starts with this story. Now, the story is really poignant because the story is going to hit David in a very, um, a very unique personal spot for him. Remember, David grew up as a shepherd. He had spent all that time in the shepherds. The story, the story centers around sheep and even a relationship with this lamb would really stand out to David, and it would, it would kind of hit at the heart of what he is. And the reason God is using this particular story is to show how greatly David had sinned against this man. And, and David's anger towards it is, is just burning. As sure as the Lord lives, I'm going to put this man to death. Uh, he doesn't even need any more details. He's fired up. He's, he's, he's really angry. He sees the, um, the injustice of it all, and, and he wants to make it correct. Um, ironically, then the word of Nathan comes, and he says, you are this man. And it really shows the, the profundity and the depth of, of David's sin, that David had been given so much, he was so wealthy, and yet he thought um, very foolishly that he would take from another man who was a faithful servant. Uriah, we found out in the chapter 4, is, um, was devout and was committed to David and was faithful, and yet David sinned grievously against him and against God. Um, and, and so the... the The judgment goes on to say, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Um, it, David, God here through Nathan is demonstrating the personal nature uh, that, that David's sin has committed, not just against Uriah and Bathsheba, but against God himself. God had been so generous and faithful, and if that wasn't enough, he would have gladly given David more. David had joy, enjoyed such intimacy and closeness with God. He understood God's heart. God himself calls David a man after his own heart, that, that for him to sin so grievously, God's sort of saying, why would you after I've dealt so kindly with you and so faithfully with you, why would you go against me and sin so grievously against me? Now, here's the moment for, for David. And, and David has now been found out. His sin has been exposed. And this thing that he's been hiding, it says in Psalm 32, when my sin was, was um, unknown, my bones wasted away. That David later on could look back at this time and say it was such a terrible time where he was trying to keep his sin hidden. And he's trying to hide it from everyone else. But now it's been exposed. and Now he has a choice. Is he going to come correct, or is he going to keep trying to hide it? You know, so often in our lives, that when sin comes, when our sin gets exposed, or, or we, we sin, we try to keep it under secret. We try to keep it hidden. And, and you know, and, and when I discipline my own kids, or I've disciplined, you know, in, as, a, as a youth pastor, kids in the ministry, one of the things I always tell people when they get found out is I say, this is really the best thing that could have happened to you. The worst thing that could have happened to you is you get away with it. Because that just leads to more sin and more rebellion and more hard-heartedness. And so when we sin and God gives us an opportunity for repentance, that's the greatest thing that he can do. And the greatest thing that that we can do is is to repent and turn to God and deal with it. 
God is going to deal with, with David very severely here. The punishment for this sin is going to be very severe. But it still is better than if his sin had, had remained hidden. And I just want to say, I think the lesson here is clear for us, is that, is that when we sin, our, our best and greatest hope is to come straight to God in repentance and turning and, and, and come correct with him and then just receive our punishment, whatever that is. It says, now therefore, this is the, uh, or David in, in, in or, or uh, I'm sorry, Nathan continues the judgment. Now therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with, with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Um, as we continue to read 2 Samuel in the next few chapters, we're going to see that the, the consequences of this are going to follow David for the rest of his life. The rest of his life, he's going to suffer tremendously because of this sin and the consequences that are going to come from it. And so this promise that I'm going to raise up a sword, the sword will never depart from your house, and, and I'm going to give your wives to your companion, that's talking about his son Absalom, and, and two chapters later, who's going to lead a rebellion and try to, um, he's, going to he's going to sleep with David's concubines in, in front of all of Israel. In fact, in the same place where David committed this sin with Bathsheba, he's going to do it in broad daylight. And then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You know, he, he says later on, Psalm 51, verse 4, he says, against you and you only have I sinned. David recognized whatever his sin towards Bathsheba, whatever his sin towards Uriah, really this sin was against God and his faithfulness. And, and he recognizes that he needs to get right with God. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has taken away your sin. You shall not die. He's forgiven you. However, because of this deed, you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also is born for you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. You know, there's a difference between forgiveness and consequences. Sometimes we miss this as Christians. We just think God's grace is so good and he forgives us. But that doesn't mean that all the consequences are gone from our sins. When we sin against God, is there still consequences remain? You might, um, you know, violate God's commandments in regards to sex or or those kinds of things, and, and God will forgive you of those things for sure. And that forgiveness is good and it's beautiful. It doesn't mean you're not going to suffer consequences because of those things, so because of those sins, because of lies, because of the ways we live our lives, because of ungodly ways of thinking. Um, we have to make our, our, our repentance complete and then still walk out and deal with the consequences. Well, God forgives him, and, and in the next couple verses, it's, it talks about the punishment that happens is that the child that was born to Bathsheba gets sick that very day. And interestingly, it says... Um, it says the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David. Um, this is the Lord doing this. The kid gets sick. David falls on his face, and he, he's interceding for God. He's fasting. His servants are trying to help him. He's, he's praying for this kid that God would, would turn from this, that he wouldn't do it, that he might relent, that he might have mercy on David. And, and then after seven days, the child dies, and David gets up, and he eats, and his servants say, wait, I wouldn't understand you were grieving before, why aren't you grieving now? And David says, well, uh, when the child was alive, there's a chance that God might relent, and so I was seeking God for that, but now that he's dead, um, there's nothing I can do. And then he says, interestingly, he says that, um, that uh, in verse 23, he says, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. That David believed in the next life, that this child now is in the hands of God, and that the next time that David saw him was when David died and when David goes to him. Um, the rest of the, the, the chapter is, is Solomon is born, who's going to become the next king to Israel, be, um, uh, given to, to, to Bathsheba and to David. And then we get this really interesting, kind of challenging verses about, um, in these last 26 through 31, about what happens as they go and they fight the Ammonites. Um, a lot of biblical scholars actually believe that this section um, in chronological order actually happened before Nathan had come to David and called him out, that when we find Uriah, he's actually killed on the siege of, um, of the city of Reba, um, which is an Ammonite city. And, and that's the battle that Uriah is killed in. And then, and then it says that Joab says, I'm about to take the city. I've won the city. Now you come out and join us so that you'll get the credit. You know, David will get the credit for winning the city. And then we get this problematic verse in verse 31. It says, he, after he... he, he conquered the king, and, and he defeated the city. He, he takes his crown, but it says, he also brought out the people who were in it and set them under saws, sharp iron instruments and iron axes, and made them pass through the brickland. And thus he did to all the cities of the sons of Ammon. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. What this is talking about here is torture. 
Um, and, and what's interesting is we don't find Israel doing this at any other battle, any other place in the history we have in the Old Testament, um, that David treated the Ammonites um, very harshly. He put them under iron weapons. He tortured them. He sawed them in half. Um, he, he made them pass through the Brooklyn, which is like a... Um, uh, um, you, like where you bake bricks in um, a, a, an oven, and so he would, he would burn them. I mean, it was just all this terrible stuff. And what's interesting is that, one, the Ammonites were very cruel people. They, they did just as bad things to the Israelites, so maybe that was why. But if this happened before David, when he's walking around with his sin hidden, and he's just responding and acting out in ways that are totally not contrary to, they're totally contrary to his personality and, and the kind of man that he was, um, is, is really kind of a, a challenging thing. And, and just thinks about, you know, when we carry around unresolved sin and, we, and un, unrepented sin, is that a lot of times it causes us to grow bitter, angry, um, abusive, and, and do terrible things. And so I just really, I think the whole theme of this chapter is that we really need to come to God and be quick to repent, quick to turn to Him, quick to look to Him for mercy and forgiveness, and then to, to do the things that He's called us to do and be faithful to Him. As we do that, God allows God to bring about His purposes in our life and, and do the beautiful work of of being in reconciled to God and walking with him. God bless you, church. We'll see you tomorrow.